As the field of immunotherapy and non-small cell advances, treatment selection, toxicity management, the optimal sequencing of agents, uh, particularly the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, is becoming more integral in the clinical management of lung cancer. I think it's imperative that we discuss the recent data and ongoing trials that have focused on targeting PD-1 and PD-L1 pathways in non-small cell. Uh, nivolumab, of course, has been presented at prior meetings uh, by Julie Bramer and others, has demonstrated activity uh, in heavily pretreated patients, uh, generally uh, individuals who pretty much exhausted uh, standard therapeutics with a fairly reproducible response rate in the 20, 22 percent range. Uh, Roy, if you could talk a bit about um, its uh, past and current development and where you see this drug going. Sure. Um, certainly the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, have really shifted the paradigm in the way we think of lung cancer. The fact that they have activity both in squamous and non-squamous disease and also uh, in smokers uh, in large part. Um, the nivolumab story I think is quite, quite interesting. The fact that uh, the response rate appears to be 17 percent or so uh, in, in patients is, 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 is quite good. That's a very uh, refractory population um, with uh, two-year survivals uh, over 20 percent. So I'm, I'm quite impressed. I, I think the, the issue is going to be who benefits and who doesn't. Um, the one thing that you, one does notice when they look at the survival curves with uh, uh, these drugs is that there still are many patients who aren't benefiting. Uh, it only seems to cause producer response in that small population. So I think uh, the d development of bioassays uh, to determine who has uh, the, the sensitivity. Uh, it might be PDL1, uh, which is the, uh, the peptide that's being recognized. It might be something else. I think that's going to be critical. But clearly, you know, we're, we're eagerly awaiting the results of two phase three studies now that are completed, uh, one in uh, squamous and one in the non-squamous population uh, of the drug nivolumab versus docetaxel, and hopefully we'll see those, those data soon. Um, there's been a major move to bring these agents in the first line setting, particularly in PDL1. If you could comment a bit on that as well, and then I want others to comment on whether PDL1 is the right uh, determinant. Right. Well, I, I think. Um, you know, why not bring the best therapy uh, up front? Um, certainly, if we're going to use it up front, I would want to see more development of a biomarker. Um, um, as we do know, chemotherapy does have benefits in patients up front. But certainly as a window trial, it's, it's, it's something worth doing. So here at ASCA, we're, we're, we're seeing data with one of the other compounds, which is showing very nice activity up front and uh, even higher response rates than seen in the refractory setting. And I think this makes sense. You know, p before patients have received chemotherapy, their immune system is probably um, stronger, and we might see even bigger responses. These are in PDL1 positive uh, patients, or in across in, no, in, in, yeah. in unselected patients. Unselected, yes. Hmm. So, so, so going in your comments about PDL1 as a selection uh, criteria. You know, the, the we have seen that in the PDL1 positive group, the response rates are higher. But what is important is that the PDL1 negative group, so-called negative group, you still see some reasonable response rates, like 15, 20 percent, at least 15 percent, what I've seen. The issues are, are we willing to forego that group from immunotherapy? And I think many of us would say no. And the other thing is, uh, we, we do think uh, that the immune system plays a very complicated role here, and I don't think we've really fully understood how to identify patients. It's one thing remarkable uh, that the tumors that respond well to immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors are those with high mutation burden, for example, melanoma and lung cancer. In fact, the average number of mutations in lung cancer is about 200 mutations per tumor that we just, if you sequence the coding regions, and melanoma is a little bit more than that. So could we look at the mutation burden as a, as a biomarker? Could we look at some expressed antigens? And um, could we look at uh, some other uh, biomarkers that we can develop looking at those extreme responders using comprehensive genomic analysis. I see potential opportunities and a lot of uh, ideas here, and I think we'll figure this out in the next few years. Roy, do you think there are other immunophenotypes that uh, will help us uh, determine this, or it's still pretty much a crapshoot? No, I, I think there are, and I, I think Kovinin's point is well taken, <coughs> the high mutation burden tumors. And actually, at this ASCO, we heard data about bladder cancer, you know, and some of these agents in bladder cancer, which is right up there in smoking-related disease. I think there'll be other things that we can look at. I think the one thing to keep in mind, Corey, is the assays for PDL1 are, are really all over the board. Uh, people are using different antibodies. They're measuring different things. Uh, some assays are measuring the PDL1 on the tumor cells exclusively. Some are looking at the PDL1 both at the tumor cells and on the immune microenvironment. And we know that it's not enough just to have 
uh, uh, tumors with PDL1, but you have to have T cells there as well. So you have to look at the whole, the, the whole thing. The other thing, of course, about a continuous uh, marker like this, where you say positive or negative, is what, what your cutoff is. But I think a vengeance point is well taken. There are many patients who are negative who still benefit. But I think if we're going to bring this up front, if we're going to use this as maintenance therapy in earlier stage disease, it would be nice to identify that group. Also, if we could look for other markers, perhaps there are other markers uh, on T regulatory cells or we can look at RNA profiles to help us. That might also help us scientifically to figure out what are the next combinations. Because we're oncologists, after all, and the next thing we're going to want to do is combination work. Well, you've already done that, or at least part of the ongoing efforts with nivolumab and ipilimumab. Right. Our group at Yale, uh, not me, but Mario Snall, Harry Klug, and others, I had a very nice paper uh, with Jed Walchuk and the team at Memorial last year at ASCO where they actually took uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab and used it together. Uh, this was a paper in melanoma with you know, extraordinary rapid responses in more than 50% of the patients. This experience has now been uh, seen in, in, in lung cancer uh, with not quite as impressive activity, you know, perhaps a little bit more toxicity when you combine this. In okay. our, in toxicity would be a big con concern. Nivolumab is relatively less toxic than ipilimumab, but uh, ipi, particularly in a relatively unhealthy lung cancer population as opposed to a melanoma population. Right. I, I would be very concerned. It's a little bit more difficult. It requires experience, you know, and there's, there's a user curve to, to get, get used to doing it. And then, of course, you run the risk if you start lowering the doses of these drugs, you know, what's the optimal combination? So I think that combination probably has potential in, in lung cancer, probably needs a bit more work from what we've seen at this ASCO, um, but, it, but it, it's, it's, it's one avenue that's being explored. Steroids pretty much uh, abrogate or help mitigate this toxicity routinely, or they can help. Certainly, the pneumonitis, which was seen early on uh, with nivolumab alone, um, has been uh, much mitigated by using uh, early steroids and recognizing the problem. But I think our lung population is a bit sicker than those patients who have melanoma. There's been concern about steroids uh, nullifying the activity. Has that been observed? Um, not, not enough experience to say for sure, but in the small experience, probably not. So, um, so I think that that's okay. Alice, you...